The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Is believing in Christ's finished work the same as believing in Him for everlasting life? What does it mean to believe in Him, as John 3.16 and the rest of John puts it? That'll be our topic today on Grace in Focus. Glad you have joined us. This is the radio broadcast and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. Please join us also on our Monday, Wednesday, Friday YouTube videos, our YouTube channel, The Grace Evangelical Society. And find out more about us at our website, faithalone.org. Now with today's discussion, here are Bob Wilkin and Steve Elkins. Okay, Steve, I think you have a question from someone. Who's the question from? It's from Matt. He says, if someone trusts in the finished work of Christ for their salvation, is that not considered believing in Jesus? I think that's uh, kind of interesting. If they trust in the finished work of Christ for their salvation. Now, for their salvation, Bob, it seems to me, if they understand that they're eternally saved, that they have eternal life, that they're going to live with Jesus forever or any number of equal statements to that effect, then I think believing in the finished work of Christ is absolutely just fine. Yeah, except here's what I think Matt may be asking. Let's say a person believes in the finished work of Christ for his salvation, but he does not believe that by faith in Christ, he has everlasting life. He does not believe by faith in Christ, he will never perish. He believes he has salvation for now, but he has to persevere to keep it. And of course, that would not be right. That would not be right. So I've met lots of people, lots of people who say They believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and rose again, and that as a result, they're saved for now. Yeah, and that's so sad. Right. So if what Matt means is that, the answer would be no. That's not the same as believing in Jesus in John 3.16. If, however, they mean that the person recognizes that the finished work of Christ means that John 3.16 is true— then they not only believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose again, they also believe that by faith in him, they'll never perish. Exactly. They're eternally secure. Right. And so it's important that we recognize that belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus, there's no guarantee that's saving. That's right. Not in and of itself. But the fact is, and I know we'd agree on this, many people who have it dawn on them, you know, the magnificence of Christ's death in their place for their sins. Right. They actually do have a little bit of Bible knowledge. They went to vacation Bible school. Right. They heard John 3.16. They have some concept of eternal life, even of the word saved, being eternally saved. Right. And in the back of their minds, when they hear that Christ died for their sins, that includes to them possibly— All that John 3.16, I don't want to say baggage, but stuff they were carrying. And maybe they did come to faith later after hearing about Christ's death and so forth. But included in that, in their thinking, was the truth of John 3.16. Yeah. You notice that Matt asks about the finished work of Christ. I've heard lots of people point to that and say, well, didn't Jesus say on the cross, it is finished, right? Yeah. When he said that, that means there's no other payment needed, right? right? It's already all been paid. But what people often get confused about is, okay, it's all paid, but then they think that's just my initial salvation. The final salvation is not paid for yet. That I must pay my part. And so people sometimes say, well, if it's the finished work, then it's all of it's finished. Initial salvation, what some people call final salvation, it's final the moment I believe, right? We've talked about this before. And so if that's what he means, yes, I think a person can get to the promise of everlasting life and never perish through the finished work of Christ, but it's not obvious. You need to explain it to people. Yeah, you absolutely do. And just because somebody says the words that Christ died for my sins, what they understand by that is everything. Right. Let's say somebody, you you were talking with a friend or a family member, and they said, yeah, Jesus is my Savior. My question would be, great, what does that mean to you? Exactly. In what sense is he your Savior? Has he already saved you? 
Right. And the person will be like, well, well yeah, well, well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is, what if you didn't go to church for the rest of your life and you became an alcoholic and died as a, an alcoholic? Where would you go? And if the person is like, well, I'd go to hell, then you'd say, well, so he hasn't saved you yet. Right. He maybe has given you probation or something, but salvation is yet future for you. And, and if he said that, I'd say, you know, you're missing out on what Jesus promises, which is that he who believes in me will not perish, but has everlasting life. Absolutely. And exactly what you're saying is true with so many phrases in the Bible, whether it's even believing that Jesus is the Christ, right? believing he's the one sent from God, believing he's God, certainly believing that he died for my sins, etc. Again, what one understands in that. Those phrases just in themselves aren't saving by themselves. Right. They don't have the knowledge that we need. We have to have the knowledge that we get eternal life by believing Jesus for it. I remember at our conference, we just had Dix Winston gave a talk on bluff, yep. bottom line up front first. Yeah. And he said, when you talk to somebody right away, get the lead out there at the first paragraph uh-huh. and tell them the three things they need to know. The person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has everlasting life. So the three elements are believing in the Lord Jesus Christ for everlasting life. And you make that clear, and then they may have lots of questions, and you can talk about the finished work of Christ. You can talk about Mm. the fact that he lived a perfect life, and he died as the perfect sacrifice, and that his blood atoned for our sins. He's a propitiation for our sins and for the whole world. You could talk about a lot of things, or you can let them ask you questions, which uh-huh. is a great way to go. Let them bring up questions. Well, that's excellent. The Grace Evangelical Society has recently started an online seminary, and we're preparing to start our second semester in February. You can study with some of the finest free grace professors and earn an MDiv degree in three years. There is no tuition if you maintain a 3.0 grade point average. It's time now for application and registration. Study the Bible, the biblical languages, and free grace theology with us. Find out more at faithalone.org slash seminary or gesseminary.org. Are you ready to go on to another one? Yeah, you got a question from somebody else? A fellow named M.L. says, How could the Lord Jesus bear the sins of the world for us if the Bible mentions in Ezekiel 18.20 that each person is responsible for his own sin? Okay, that's a great question. Now let's read Ezekiel 18.20. 18.20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. This chapter came up in my book, Turn and Live, The Power of Repentance. In fact, Turn and Live comes from Ezekiel 18 and Ezekiel 31. The point here, this isn't dealing with unlimited atonement. This isn't questioning unlimited atonement. The point here is that in this life, we reap the consequences for our actions so that the soul that sins will die prematurely. This is the sin unto death. And he goes on to say that the righteous person will be rewarded for his righteousness and the wicked person will be recompensed for his wickedness. It's just like the consequence motif that's throughout the book of Proverbs. Right. You know, the righteous man, life's going to generally go well for him. These are sayings, of course. Right. And the soul that tendeth toward unrighteousness and so forth is going to end up dying. And that's true for a believer or an unbeliever. That's right. So if a believer is living righteously and then falls away, that believer is going to be on the path of death. Right. And if they don't repent soon, they're going to die prematurely. Now, it could be taken, too, that this is a general principle, the statement, the soul that sins shall die. That's true, and we could use it in evangelistic terms if we want, because the wages of sin is death for anybody. Right. Of course, the wages of sin is death is not saying the wages of sin is eternal condemnation, because Jesus took our sins out of the way so that what's interesting, Hodges makes the good point in Revelation twenty eleven to 15, the great white throne judgment, people aren't condemned because of their works. Right. They're condemned because their names are not in the book of life. That's right. Revelation twenty fifteen, And that has nothing to do with what Ezekiel's saying in this verse. What Ezekiel is basically talking about is the blessing cursing motif. 
if we obey God, he will bless us. If we disobey God, he will curse us. And that's true in the Old Testament, like Isaiah 26, Deuteronomy 28. But it's all through the Old Testament, and it's all through the New Testament. You can't get away from divine chastisement. Absolutely. The fact, too, that if a non-believer ends up at the great white throne judgment, he's there for his deeds that he's done, his sins. But the books are open, he's judged according to his deeds. He's there because his name's not in the book of life, obviously. Right. And it's interesting. The reason that the works are examined is not explained in Revelation 20, verses 11 to 14. But we do know the basis of condemnation is anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We know from other scripture that everyone is going to be judged according to their works. So at the judgment seat of Christ, every Christian will be judged according to our works. At the great white throne judgment, every non-Christian is going to be judged according to their works. It's kind of mirror image. The believers are judged to determine their degree of reward in the kingdom. Uh The unbelievers are judged to determine their degree of torment in the lake of fire. Each one is judged for his works or her works. Not somebody else. Conversely, in the book of life, I'm not there because I was born into a Christian family and my parents were good Christians. That's right. And by the way, part of what Ezekiel 18.20 is talking about, there were verses in the uh, Torah that said the sins of the father passed to the third and the fourth generation. That became a kind of a saying in Israel where they would say, well, you know, the father uh, eats the green grape and the son's the one that experiences the pain of the, <laughs> eating the green grape. Well, what Ezekiel is saying, no, you reap the consequences for your own sins. But I would say the principle found in the Torah still exists. Sure. We see this in adult children of alcoholic literature all the time. What they say is if either of your parents was an alcoholic, you're like 10 times more likely to become an alcoholic than the average person. And in fact, this even goes back to your grandparents. And so that's one of the reasons I don't drink at all. Wine is a big thing in the wisdom literature. At Jesus' ministry, it was a big thing. Uh, at At the Last Supper, they had wine. I don't drink, and the reason I don't drink is because I don't want to be an alcoholic. And so... I have a certain amount of fear that because my father's father was an alcoholic, my father was an alcoholic, lots of alcoholics on both sides of my family tree, I just figure I'm not going to drink. It makes it harder to become an alcoholic. That was a great question. Matt asked a good question as well. Thank you both. And Steve, thank you for your time here. This has been a pleasure having you, and we'll have you on again in a couple weeks. We look forward to it. Thanks again, and keep grace. In focus. Read many from our library of thousands of free magazine and journal articles online at faithalone.org slash resources. That's faithalone.org. Did you miss an episode of Grace and Focus that you really wanted to hear? Just come to faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We have all our past episodes right there on the site. Our team is really great about answering questions, comments, and feedback. If you've got some, we hope to hear from you. Let me give you our email address so you can do just that. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next episode, we take a look back at our 2023 National Conference. One of our guests will be interviewed, and I think you'll like it. Hope you join us. Until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.